Yeah. Can you touch the top? There we go. To the Poetry of Justice show with Jackie Ray Phillips here on yaksradio.com and acceleratedradio.net. Now here on the Poetry of Justice show, this is where social consciousness meets the arts. And what we do is we select topics that spark the interest and awareness of social diversity, ranging from arts, entertainment, and social justice at large, leaving our listeners thinking and saying... Yikesradio.com <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, those are the sultry sounds of my mentor, the Mr. Kevin Nash. Mr. Kevin Nash is the owner of this proprietorship here at Accelerated Radio, and I always just take the time to give him a shout out for respect and love because of his brainchild that allows me to do what I so love to do here on Saturday nights, ladies and gentlemen. And then I'm going to get into our sponsorship, guys. I want to give a very special shout out to my sister, Miss Lori G, the benefactor here on the podcast. Hey, guys. How are you tonight, sissy? I'm doing good. A little technical stuff I got going on over here. It's but it's all good. That part right there is all good, ladies and gentlemen. And then I want to give a very special shout out to more of our sponsorships. That is G Babies Catering, everybody. G B A B B I E S Catering. You can find Chef Mac on Instagram again. That's G Babies L L C. That's family, everybody. So please check that out for us, ladies and gentlemen. And then I'd like to give a very special shout out to WMPJ Steelworks. We call this guy the man of steel here on the show, ladies and gentlemen. So thank you for what you do and your contributions to the show. We appreciate you. And then last but not least, I'm going to go on ahead and give another shout out to a new venture. And it's APS Muscle Car Sponsorship, ladies and gentlemen. This guy here is doing custom build hot rods and low riders, just about anything you need. Also, Harley Davidson's. If you happen to have some big toys that you need to store away, you want to reach out to this guy. His name is Mimo, M-E. M-O with APS Muscle Cars, ladies and gentlemen. That's in Signal Hill, California. So shout out to the sponsorship, guys. I always like to show that love. So that's us, ladies and gentlemen. That's the introduction here uh, for the Poetry of Justice show with Jackie Ray Phillips on yikesradio.com. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. How are you tonight, Big Tab? Oh, great. Got my boys in there. We got home. Yeah, home. So we're going to bring it on in right, you know? I see that. I see a glow in your face. And so I'm honored <laughs> to see that. Yes. And so what we want to do tonight, I would like to welcome everyone to the show. And I want to welcome two I say, I'm saying sport legend because once I began the research that was provided to me, there's, for me, there was no other uh, moniker that I could place on tonight's show. So I'd like to welcome Mr. Gene Banks. How are you tonight, sir? I'm doing just fine. I'm very honored to be uh, on this show and, and to listen to that intro. Oh, I'm, I'm going to be tuning in all the time now. Well, that is a blessing. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> that voice, I tell you, it's a soothing yeah, see, well, nice and slow, you know. Ah, Mr. Larry Doby Jr., my, my, my. How are you doing tonight, sir? I'm doing just fine, young lady, and uh, very pleased to be here and looking forward to it. It's going to be great times. Lori G., I know I see you over there, so you're going ahead and say good evening to our beautiful guest now. I am. Good evening. How's everyone doing? Well, all good here. All good. You all just look amazing and magnificent. Now, are you up to the challenge for some great conversation tonight? <laughs> oh, yes. always, always. Always. <laughs> so I understand that the three of you are very good friends. Is that accurate? Do you That's pretty accurate. Pretty accurate. Yeah. Yeah. So yes. I'm interested in knowing how the friendship began. How did the three of you meet? Well. Let me start off, gentlemen. The Larry, me and Larry, back in the eighties, early eighties, we got acquainted, and um, I knew of Gene. I used to see Gene play ball because Gene's from West Philly, where I'm from. 
Speed boys. Yeah. Right, speed boys. He, I, I went to Oglebrook. Gene went to West Philly Speed Boys. He was coached by Mr. Goldenberg and my uncle Ralph Rice, and they they were the number one team in the nation. In the when, nation, tap. In the nation, when Gene yeah. was a senior. in the okay. nation. Okay. Gene was the number one player in the Thank nation. You. Thank you. And the rivalry was unbelievable, but we had over my school, we were great and we were second to none. And we had the women. So, you know, <laughs> there you go. Right. And the women. women. There we go. Oh, right. you know, good stuff, right? <laughs> I wasn't allowed to come over there. <laughs> Why not? Uh oh, you had been in the hen house too many times. <laughs> no, no. And, and I'm let me good. tell you, and I'm, let me tell I'm, you, the rivalry, the rivalry was unbelievable. And just to let you know, I think even though Gene was his status and he was who he was, it was incredible. We still have the the bigger uh our alumni, maybe we got West Philly speed boys by a notch. You know, it's pretty all, close. It's pretty close. All, pretty all close. I gotta do is say Wilt Chamberlain. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> yeah, they they, they gotta Wally distinguish Jones, Wally Jones. Hey, wait a minute. Did Andre McCarter go to Brooke? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Unbelievable. Listen, it ain't close, Gene. I'm sorry. Now, when you were playing, <laughs> it's not close. Oh, oh you, you forgot one. You forgot one. Yeah, Will I got Smith. I forgot a lot. Will Smith. Will Smith went to Old Brook. Smith went, went to Old Brook. Malik Rose went to Old Hey, look, it goes on and on and on. And uh, Jackie Tapper went to Old Brook. My Thank mom you. Was, Jackie. <laughs> She was the one who called. You know, I, this was the first time, Gene, that I found out all my mom age people used to call Wilt Moehead. He had this big body and this small head. Yep. They called him <laughs> Moehead. Moehead. <laughs> yeah. Will Chamberlain, Jackie, and Lori was the only NBA player to score 100 points a game. And definitely with, in the discussion for greatest of all time. Yeah, yes, he's in the totally. discussion. Yeah, they song. always talk about LeBron and Michael Jordan. No disrespect to them, but that discussion has to include Wilt and Norman Chamberlain. Oh, for sure, for sure. Yep. But oh, um, but, but 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 tap you, you now. You talked about Overbrook and their great alumni. We had Evelyn Champagne King that went to our school. You know, we had also Tyrell Biggs, who was my backup on that same team, who won the super heavyweight gold medal in the Olympics. Yes, he did. I didn't know uh, Tyrell Biggs went to West Philly. Well, yep. well that's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to educate you, Mr. Tapper. Yes, yes. He, he was my backup. From, an, oh, from Overbrook to West Philly, you're going to switch your allegiance tonight. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, <laughs> the story is, Jackie, I, I don't know if I ever told, told the ladies, Gene, that, you know, although he's five, six years young, he went to school with my sister, but Will Smith went to school with us. You know, I grew up with Will in Winfield. You know, mm -hmm. he was going to the Avenue and I was, but he was a young boy. You know, mm -hmm. I was you know, five years, six, you know. We go by rank in Philadelphia. You either old head, young boy, and stuff like that, Jack. That's okay. right. That's right. All right. Gene was Gene was Gene and Larry's my old heads, but uh, <laughs> but not by far. I was hanging with them, but they was my old head. You I know, ain't mad Gene, at you. Gene got me about Gene and Larry got me about three years, yeah. So, you know, I'm a young buck. I'm a buck. All right. So listen, now I'm going to tell about my friendship with both of these gentlemen. All right. Number one, I worked at the Hard Rock Cafe on 57th Street in New York City for about five years. And that's where I met Gerald Tapper. And he became a lifelong friend and one of my closest, dearest friends. We've been through a lot of good times and a lot of fun times together, you know, and some not so good times. But we still uh, keep the friendship and I hope that it lasts as long as I'm here. So that's what I'll say about Mr. Tapper. <laughs> as far as Mr. Gene LaVon Banks is concerned, I met him when I went to Duke University. And um, I was a couple years ahead of Gene. So I was there before he got there. And I know what basketball was like before he got there, as opposed to when he got there and since he's gone. So I, I don't want to throw too many um, superlatives on him, but he's basically the foundation of where Duke is today. 
he's the first black star to come to Duke, the, the highest rated player ever to come to Duke. He can only be tied. If you're number one in the nation, you can only be tied. You can't be beaten. So I want to say that about him. But before he got to Duke, the rivalries, you know, in the ACC, especially Carolina, I probably is similar to Overbrook and West Philly, but we never beat them. And when he got there, that's when we started beating them. And I'm talking about storybook names, Phil Ford, Walter Davis, Mitch Kupchak, so forth and so on, all the way up to Michael Jordan and whoever else you want to talk about. But Gene's choosing Duke over practically any school he could have went to is, is one of the reasons why Duke is on the map where they are today. And I just, um, I, I know I was there before he got there. They had two All-Americans. They had Mike Jaminski who played in the pros. They had Jim Spernarco who played in the pros and they didn't win until Gene got there. So it was really nice of me to see it go from a 500 mediocre kind of program to one of the best programs in the country. And my friendship with Gene has basically started since he walked on campus. And again, I hope it continues as long as I'm here. Always. Always. Gene, I have a question for you. What made you, what was the driving force that made you decide on Duke over all the other choices as Larry has described? It's pretty interesting, you know, being a number one player in the country, you had a lot of people trying to recruit you. And I was getting letters from everywhere. Most of the pressure came to me of trying to stay home. They wanted me to stay home uh, because Philadelphia has a <clears throat> Temple University, St. Joe's, Villanova, uh, LaSalle and Penn. Uh, and I would have went to the University of Penn uh, because of the fact that it would have been staying home, so to speak, if that pressure got on me. The problem with going to the University of Penn was at that time, you know, way back when, and I'm going to educate some folks too, a lot of players back in the 60s, they couldn't play varsity basketball their freshman year. Um, and then they lifted the rule. Uh, I don't know if it was 71 or something like that, but the Ivy League still held the rules. Or if you became yeah. as a freshman, you couldn't still play varsity. You had to play on the freshman team. So that eliminated me going to the University of Pennsylvania because I felt I was good enough to play varsity. I was not going to play on the freshman team. Um, since you, y'all Cali folks, I, I visited UCLA. Okay. Uh, I did have a chance to go to, uh, the Playboy Mansion. <laughs> if they, if, <laughs> whoa, if they, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Was it how did you imagine it to be? Let me just say this. If they had the letter of You there with Bill with, Cosby? Just I'm tell me that. A note. Were you Playboy there with Bill? Mansion. No, I wasn't there with Bill. Bill okay. wasn't there at that time. Marcus, Marcus Johnson took me. Marcus Johnson was playing for UCLA at the time. And uh, he, he took me over there. But if they had the, the National Letter of, of Intent to sign that day, I would have signed it. Let me just say <laughs> that. <laughs> Period. That Cali you know, love, y'all. That, that Cali, Cali love. You know, the women, they were walking around. They were, they were you know, it was, it, was, it was wholesome and quiet and peaceful. And we had nice conversations. Anyway, we'll move right along with that. That's, that's a detail <laughs> of another, <laughs> another story. That's for the next show. I think that's, yeah. that's, that is definitely going to come up in tea time. I'm, I'm, I'm certain of it. But get to the root of it. I knew nothing about Duke. I wasn't really into, into the South too much. Um, my English teacher, uh, Dr. William H. Debwaller, was a guy when Duke uh, came and they, they sent a book to my high school coach. My high school coach gave it to me. It was, a, it was a brochure, but it wasn't about the basketball team. It was on the school. Pictures of the school and all nine yards. My English teacher saw it. Uh, I still had one more choice to go visit a school and and uh, he kept harping, harping. You got to go. He was always talking academics. You got to go this for the done and go check it out. And it's, it's a fine school. So to get him off my back, I said, you know what? It's the fine. I'll go visit the school. And that stopped him. Uh, like all the schools, I went. I visited six of them. Uh, NC State, Carolina, Michigan, Notre Dame, UCLA. Uh, and they were big name schools that were on television as well. So that was a big influence on me too. television with these guys being a national uh, national uh, championship games and so forth. So when I visited Duke, I, I saw Duke. It was beautiful, no doubt. But I, I met a, a, a small group of Black folks that were there. There wasn't a lot of us, as Larry will tell you. There wasn't a lot of them that were there, but a small, a small group of them, they were having a good time. They were bonding. Um, and I like that. You know, people like uh, Mike Bennett, you know, he, he was an influence on me. Uh, Caroline Lattimore, Dean Borens. There were so many people in positions at Duke that were black that caught my attention. And I was able to get away from Harold Morrison, who was, who was uh, <laughs> a teammate of mine. And he almost got in trouble because he lost me. 
but I wanted <laughs> to walk around and see it and feel it for myself. And when I saw that the, the black contingency was the one, the thing that really brought my attention, even though they have been in last place for like five, six years in a row, I just said, you know, I think I can really do something with that. But to go really further, it was totally divine intervention when I had to really make my decision. Um, I was able to come home from all recruiting. I told my mom, I said, mom, I really don't know where I want to go. Every school is just, I'm 17 years old from West Philly in the inner city. Uh, and every school was just as nice as the other one. And I said, I really don't know where I want to go. My mom said, we're, up at, we're in my room. She, she says, I want you to stay in this room. I want you to pray about it. That's exactly what she said. I want you to pray about it. She closed my door and she locked it. My mother never locked my door ever. She locked the door, kept people away from me, kept people, uh, friends and family. So I laid down, I put on my album. I had, I had this thing about Barry White. I love Barry White, you know, baby, baby, please. I love you, baby, baby, please. I know all that kind of thing. <laughs> so I laid down, I closed my eyes. And when I closed my eyes, I dreamt of wearing a Duke uniform. And this is, this is the truth. And I dreamt of the season and all the things that were happening and this and that and that. When I woke up the next morning, I said, mom, I know where I want to go because my mom always taught us to believe in visions. You know, sometimes God speaks to you and you just got to listen. Uh, and I told her, she didn't even tell her what school. And uh, make a long story short, uh, they called the school. They said, wait, you know, the, the world's going to want to know. Uh, and we're walking up to school. And here I am, 17 years old, getting ready to make the biggest decision. I'm like, I'm scared. I'm scared. My mom's walking with me. We're only five blocks from the school. We live on 53rd and Spruce Street. And I'm scared. And the greatest thing, that I'll always remember. It was like my mom walked me to kindergarten, my first day in kindergarten. And I'm walking and I'm scared, figuring out this is a big decision. She puts her hand in my hand and she looks down at me and says, everything's gonna be okay. And when she did that, and my chest filled up, I walked in and I told him I'm gonna go to Duke. When I said I was going to Duke, everybody said, what the hell? What the, does Duke have a basketball team? <laughs> <laughs> People were nuts. You know, the, the, the media people ran out. They didn't have the cell phones as they have now. People ran out to them and get a phone call to call down and get the scoop of the story. And I said, I want to go to Duke. I want to make them a national power. And if all goes well with God with me, that's going to happen. And the funniest thing about it, I go there my freshman year, as Larry uh, saw. Yep. Mm -hmm. We went, we, everything I dreamt about, and I'm not just lying, Lori, and, and you guys and the engineering. Everything I dreamt about happened. We went straight to the championship game. Unbelievable, you know. So uh, uh, it was. It was. A, it was a. It was. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> so it was. It was really destiny. It was really a destined thing for me to do, and I didn't even know it. I was just following through with where my destiny was supposed to go. Are you still Gee, as passionate it, about one, one question, real quick. Um, I'm sorry, Jack. Sure, no, no, go ahead. Gee, why the number? 20 when you were a big man that's a that's a deep story you know you know i used to i used to like to have number seven you know when i played in the, when I played down in, in south philly when but you know how i found out the number 20 how this is so spiritual even my grandfather was born in mobile alabama okay i learned that out he played in the negro league and i went down the basement he had this big old those old trunks that you open up and i opened up the trunk and he, it was one of those gray flannel old wool jerseys yeah, that they yeah, wore yeah. back then. And it, it had the number 20 on the back of it. And uh, I, it, we, we didn't have a long conversation. I knew he played, he talked about it a little bit. And ever since I saw that jersey, when I went down the basement, my grandpa was, since I stayed with him a couple of years, uh, I, I changed whatever number and I took that number, number 20, because of my grandfather, because he played in the Negro League. Nice. And, I, and I've had it ever since, which is which is amazing. I've had it throughout my career, no matter where I went. Chicago and San Antonio. Yep, San Antonio, Duke, San Antonio, Chicago, right. overseas, everywhere. You know, and, and it's in honor of my grandfather that he's with awesome. me. Awesome. I got I got to tell you this too. That's the first and only time I ever rooted for Duke was against, <laughs> was against you in Kentucky. When y'all lost in that championship, that hurt me, man. Jack Gibbons, I hated him ever since. But um, Gene, you know, I was pulling with you because you know you from the home team, and you was you was that dude. But that that was the only time after that. Oh, you know, I'm, I'm Carolina. A, tell him. Tell him. Carolina. Gene, he a Carolina. He, he's a Carolina guy. 
Yeah, he's got he's yeah. got to tell me about Rasheed Wallace and all these dudes. I don't uh, want to hear it. I don't want to hear yeah. it. But yes. He, do, 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 do you know, do you guys know in that championship game, it's noted now that I got a death threat during that game. I read about um, that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. My mom, I, I didn't understand it. I, I had two cops when I came off the court during shoot around with Kenny and myself. They followed. I just thought that was procedure because it was a huge event, right. twenty something thousand people. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. But my, my mom and dad, when they were set up, they had some cops around them, uh, and and they didn't tell me about it until after. I think they told my mom and dad, but uh, when that, when I was told about it, I'm, I'm like, wow, you know, this is deep. So yeah, I got I got some death threats uh for days before so i had cops outside my door down the hallway i didn't i didn't even know all that was right. kept pretty, pretty much from me they just wanted you to like sway the game in some sort of way i have no they, idea what they were trying yeah. to do they they, oh. they didn't get too close to me so to speak uh to be able to make contact That's but good. the, the people the people that were with me didn't didn't really tell me they kept it they kept it from me they just protected me but they didn't tell me about it That's great. i'm thinking that, that you know who that that was it's confirmed. That was uh, Moscow Mitch. That was Mitch. <laughs> that was <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, um, um, that also plays into the history of, you know, um, um, because even in boxing, um, um, like, you know, my certain, like, you know, my mob bosses were actually, you know, I'm a make bets mm -hmm. and, and, mm. and they don't like to lose. Right. So, so right. basically um, uh, they mm. would basically show up at your doorstep <laughs> and that's and, that, and let's see that's hey, you know that's take a, a dive. That, that, was, that was a good announcement they they weren't able to get close to me even on the elevator it was it was it was, it was such a great big, big event but i had the police with me and you, they, there was there was a big major gambling on this game you know we weren't expected to go that we were a bunch of young kids and they yep. were they were the older they were the old heads they were they were supposed to win we the old, we didn't have a senior on our team Everybody was freshmen or sophomores. Youngest team still ever to go in the NCAA championship game. Uh, but in that had that ramification. You, you also, Kentucky, you got to realize, down in Kentucky, there's a, like the good old boys, the crackers, and all that, all the whole kinds of that racial situation there with that. Because I said, why didn't they threaten Mike Jeminski or, or Jim Spinarco? Uh, yeah. Those guys. But they they came after, came after, want to come after me. Yep. Horrible. That is. You know, guys... I'd like to just take a step backward um, and talk a little bit about you growing up. And I'm really interested in each of you and your path and your journey. You're such strong and accomplished men. And I think for our listeners, it's really important that we promote um, strong black males for the younger generation. And so I'm interested in your, um, your upbringing. What was your home life like that propelled you or inspired you to make the wonderful achievements you have. Mm -hmm. And so let's start with Larry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, well, um, I come from a family of five. I had four sisters growing up. And as some of you may know, my father was um, the first black African-American baseball player in the American League. He uh, broke the color line on July 5th, 1947. Jackie Robinson was in the National League on April 15th, 1947. So obviously I came from, you know, a house that had a little more notoriety, let's say, than, than a normal house. But, um, you know, I felt like uh, I was very fortunate to be raised by my parents. My mom was a strong black woman and she basically raised the five children while my father was on the road playing baseball. So at one point they were married 32 years but they had only been together 16 because he had been playing baseball 16 of those years away at least six months of those years and my father was never pushing athletics it was always about academics to him you know and it was like they didn't care you know what my athletic prowess was or whatever they just wanted to know that I was going to end up going to college and graduating so I played all the sports in high school, football, basketball, baseball. At Duke, I played football and baseball and was lucky enough to graduate with a degree in history and philosophy in four years. And during that time, I'd say that um, I was influenced by a lot of different experiences and people that I met and, and had while I was there. And Gene was one of the biggest. He was somebody who didn't have to come to Duke 
you know, could have found many reasons to go a lot of other places and decided to come here. And then I don't know if he'll ever tell you this, but after his freshman year, the NBA wanted him to go hardship and would have made him a rich man. And he decided to stay. And I always respect him for that because he could have left and took the money. Like it, it's done all the time now, one and done. Back then it was only for a few special players, one of which was Gene Banks and he ended up staying. But I guess the most ironic thing about my time at Duke was when Jackie Robinson broke in, there were a bunch of players who signed a petition that didn't want to play with a black player on the field. And they got all these signatures and, you know, we're going to present it to the uh, commissioner and Enos Slaughter was one of those people who signed that petition. He was my baseball coach at Duke. So it was quite ironic that, you know, somebody who was a little bit against integration would have been ended up coaching me. But as I've said many times, it doesn't matter where you start the race, it matters where you finish it. And somewhere along the line, he realized that people are equal and he treated me well. And I have very good memories of that. And, you know, my Duke experience was, you know, one of the best experiences of my life. And I still call a lot of those people, you know, good friends to this day. So that's kind of my upbringing and where, how I ended up at Duke. It was the best school I could get into. So that's where I went. You know, Larry, I'm interested in knowing with your father being such a high profile individual and putting that spotlight on your family, did you feel any amount of pressure to make sure that you succeeded mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or? Yeah, um, I, I think so. I, but I think when you're a young kid and, you know, people are yelling things or saying things, you don't really know what it means. And your father is not a baseball player to you. He's your father. And that's all he was. You know, he basically retired when I was two years old. So I never saw him play. So, you know, you would hear things and, you know, people might be a little bit jealous of this, that, or the other thing, but to him, it was always treat people the way that they treat you, you know, and education and communication are, you know, probably, you know, two of the, the, the most important things in life. So that's just kind of the life, some of the life lessons that he taught me that I tried to, you know, carry on, you know, in my life. And I was, I think I was very fortunate to be raised by two people like that. So Gene, why don't you introduce us a little bit to your upbringing and background? Ooh, very interesting. I was born more or less in South Philly than in West Philly. People don't really know that. I eventually moved to uh, West Philly. Uh, we lived down in, in South Philly for most most part. And then eventually uh, my mom and dad uh, at one time, it's, it, was, it was seven of us. Well, totally it was eight. It was eight of us in total. Uh, I did have one sister that came right behind me. Her name was Venice. Venice had got stricken with spinal meningitis as a baby and if you know they they can control spinal meningitis now as when you're a baby but back then <clears throat> they didn't have it and when she got affected by it uh her her she crossed her arms and crossed her legs and it did something with her brain or whatever the case may be and when she did that she became frozen as a young child uh so uh -huh. that was a challenge we had to deal with uh and the doctor said she wouldn't live be to no more than 10 years old. She lived to be close to 19. Uh, but we had to, after a while, being at the home for a while, uh, we, my mom was an amazing woman to the fact that, of handling it and dealing with it. And we had to eventually put her in a home uh, when she got about six or seven. Uh, we finally had to do that. It, hurt, it affected my dad a whole lot. Um, and eventually my mom and dad, we, they, they split, uh, they separated and then, um, uh, you know, they, were, they weren't angry or, or mad or anything like that, but then uh, they just split and, and my dad feels he was affected because he felt he got the wrong medicine for her uh, and that caused that, but we found out that wasn't really the truth. Uh, and then my mom, uh, who is like a Mother Teresa, uh, when she, she was always looking after all of us, making sure everybody was in tune and so forth and so on. Um, she was my greatest inspiration because she allowed me to spread my wings. But the one thing that she did with us, um, once we moved from South Philly to West Philly, we had a church in our basement. Okay. <laughs> we had, wow. and, we, and we were raised Pentecostal. All right. So, <laughs> so, um, 
the thing was, after my mom and dad split, I left and went back to, I went and spent some time with my grandfather. My grandfather was my hero. He was always my hero from my dad's side. And uh, eventually my dad decided to, I wanted to stay with my grandfather for a while. My mom allowed it to be, and that was okay. Uh, and then my dad wanted me to live with him. He got remarried and I stayed with my dad for a while, but you know, stepmothers are not really cool or certain things like that. And you had enough. Uh, I went back to my mom's home uh, and, and she was in West Philly. That's how I wound up going back there. And that's when I, my first day going back to see my mom, my brothers and sisters after three year layoff being with my dad, I seen him from time to time. He's driving me up to the house and we hear this music a block away. Like there's a concert. So, you no, know, you know, I'm in the car, my bags are packed. I'm driving, he's driving up, you know, and, and, and this is the first time I'm gonna see him really be back with my brothers and sisters. My mom remarried as well, uh, was getting ready to get remarried. And um, I go up and, and I get out the car and the house is moving. I mean, the house <laughs> is actually moving. Is they jamming? You ever seen Pentecostal churches jam? They jam. Yeah. I go up and knock on the door, looking at my dad, what the sad, my dad waves at me, he drives out. <laughs> Boom, he's gone. My mom finally comes up, opens the door, hugs me. Come here, hey baby, put your bags over there. Come on downstairs. I go downstairs. There is pews, altar, everybody's jamming. You know, it, I saw my brothers and sisters. It was the craziest thing I ever saw in my life in a basement. And it was like a church. So um, I was raised in the Pentecostal for a church and, uh, and you know, we had to, had the, the rules, the, the, the white shirt, black pants, my sisters, you know, they were, but it was amazing how I was taught the Bible and the religion because it was my aunts were the pastor, Pastor Phillips and Pastor Palmer. They, they had their, you know, the evangelists, the white, the white pastors clothes on, and they were strict, strict, strict. So um, <laughs> uh, the, the great thing about it was that I loved about that was doing church before we get up and tarry. Y'all come from black churches, some of y'all, and y'all know how when they get down and praying, sometimes church is supposed to be over at three. It get, doesn't get over <laughs> till six. <laughs> so, but the great, the, the great thing about that was two of my aunts would always leave and go upstairs and they cooked. So every time after church, when we came upstairs, there was food everywhere. And my mom always believed in fruit and the whole nine yards. So when we came up cousins, neighborhood, the whole nine yards, we came up, it was like a banquet feast after every church thing so that that was where i was grounded in uh with that uh and that that helped me out a whole lot uh my mom finally remarried my stepdad here's here's another note that's going to trip you out my stepdad is the first cousin of sherman hemsley uh and, and, and yep and they and he and my he and sherman they first cousins and they look and act just alike they looked and act just alike my mom's now mind you He's short. My mom's 5'11", close to six feet. So it was like Mutt and Jeff type of thing, you know. So, uh, but we used to see Sherman Hensley a lot. You know, he's come by the house all the time. And, uh, you know, at our house at 5306 Spruce, 5306 Spruce Street was always people coming in because everybody was just building up their life. Phyllis Hyman used to come by the house and, and sit and talk. Oh, my yep. goodness. Beauty. Wow. She, Beautiful. She, she would, her and my mom be sitting there talking. I became like a little brother to her, so, so to speak. Uh, at Bubbles, who who's later became Evelyn Champagne King. My brother was dating his his sister, Wanda, and, and she would come, they would come by the house and, and all that. Uh, God almighty, just the Delphonics, guys from the Delphonics, from the, uh, the Blue Magic. They Everybody, my house was yeah, always... It was unbelievable. People were always coming in. Mom was always cooking. My grandma was in there cooking. It was all. It was like always. People were coming in all the time. So, uh, I had wonderful male role role models. I had James Flint. James Flint is the, the father of Bruiser Flint, who's now the assistant coach at Indiana. Um, and I had Deacon Young, who was. If it wasn't for Deacon Young, uh, when I played my first championships game in high school. It was on a Sunday and the pastors weren't going to, Pentecostal church, you're not allowed to play basketball on Sunday. It wow. would have derailed, derailed my whole career. It, and this is just, people just find this out now. I had to go down to the church and I had to call Deacon Young, who was at another church to come and talk to the pastors because it was not going to happen. And my mom was not going to go against the pastors. This was Sunday, games at one o'clock. It's 945. 
we were at the church. Deacon Young finally comes in. He goes back in the back and talks to him because it was like, no way you're going to play. I did not tell coach. The players, no one knew. This is my first chat with a city title game. This is on television. This is a city. Um, but Deacon Young went and said to him, he'll be more of an example if he plays and shows who he is and what he does and what he believes in than him saying here in this church right now. And he let me go and I ran down there. And lo and behold, I had some good games. I had three other players that were great on that West Philadelphia high school team were better than me, 10 times better. But this game was on TV. I had the best game of the <laughs> year. I had 24 points and 20 rebounds. It was on national TV. I mean, it was on it was on local TV. And that's where the nickname Tinkerbell came from. And that's another story. So we wouldn't even- Who did you guys beat, Gene? We beat Father Judd. Father Judd. They were the Catholic League champions. They were very good. I was just a little 10th grader and we had Tim so that's Smith. That's the city championship of Philly Catholic that was the public? A, Yep, that was the city okay. championship. We had to beat the public league first, which we had to play Brooke. Uh, right. You know, so you already, had, you already had beaten Brooke. Is that correct? We had Mr. beaten Reynolds? Brooke. We had Thank beaten you. Brooke. <laughs> Thank you. Matter of fact, <laughs> we had beaten Brooke twice that year because we were 25 <laughs> and 0. Okay. So, and we beat Brooke my senior year twice when we were 30 and 0. So, Taps, Taps got to chill back for a little bit. He got to chill back Ooh. for a little bit. <laughs> So Lewis you, Lloyd could have scored 70 points tap, but it wasn't enough. <laughs> oh, <come on. laughs> did they, did Brooke had uh, Joe Washington too? No, Joe was before me. Joe was the year oh, before me. Oh, was he? Wow. Yep. I, I think, no, 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 no. My, my, my sophomore year, no, my sophomore year, Joe was there. Joe was there because Tim Smith was, in, Tim and Smith and Joe were, were in the same age. So that, the people don't realize you talk about Ohio State, Michigan, Duke, Carolina, West Philadelphia, Overbrook was mad rivalry. Tap will tell you, it was serious rivalry. The whole city, even no matter what you, Catholic League, Public League, the whole city wanted to know about this game. Yeah, absolutely. My best game in Philly, Gene, I scored like 20 on Lonnie McFarlane. You know him? Yeah, I know Lonnie. A little, 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 little man. I call him little man. He's big yeah. man, but he's, I call him little man. Yeah, he um, went to Roman, yeah. I was upstate at the time. Right? They kicked me out of Philly. I was up in Williamsport, PA, but we had like a wheelchair clown. Some classic at Mag McGonagall Hall. We were traveling, it was doing this uh, AUs. And we played Lonnie and I, you know, I gave it to Lonnie that day. Not... <laughs> <laughs> I'm, gonna tell you, I'm gonna tell you some other irony. Here's another irony that you guys were, that, that is getting ready to come out. They, I'm, I am thinking about writing a book which is really interesting. You know, I had to take my SATs at Brook, and I had to, I had to have a police, I had to have a police escort. <laughs> Not, but, but it was just, they, they were just, they, they only, hey, they gee, did at least that. you took them because now they have players that don't even take them. Yeah, man. I, yeah. That, that, that thing is so systemically yeah. designed. Yep. I, I was scared as a dickens, man. I was, my, I was shaking and I had a cop with me again. You know, the cop was, it was just because of the rivalry thing. It wasn't. It wasn't right. because it was game. It was that rivalry thing. They just felt it might be something. We're just gonna keep an eye on it. Just so something. Right. So I got a cop following me to get my SATs done at Overbrook. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta go to Overbrook and take my SATs. God Almighty. Sounds like a Compton High School Centennial High School rivalry that we have here. we well, have yeah. in the city of Compton. It was. It was intense. I remember. I heard about y'all up there. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't even cheer on on those games because what we we got. And Lori was started. She was a little older than me, but remember there was a massive shootout. So you my know, mother, after that, she was like, "Nope, when it's Compton Centennial, you can just can't go. We just have to." Say well, it. thank you, Mama, because your guys are here to talk to us today. Sir, <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, those rivalries are no joke. No. Yeah, joke. And Lori and, and Lori, what's deep is back in back in that day when I was, it wasn't so much about guns. You know when when. when the thing you worried about was getting stabbed. You know, you got beat, you got into the bump bump, you got stabbed. A gun was really a rare thing. They had them and people got shot mostly, not like it is in this new millennium. Yeah, but back yeah. then, the thing you worried about more so was getting stabbed, you know? So that was the thing that was during that time of the gangs. Because Philly gangs, you think you talk about the Bloods and the Crips and, 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 and they're national, but Philly gangs were the gangs back in the day. They were the gangs back in the day. But the difference between the gangs then and the gangs now, those gang members back then, they caught you. 
and you had something going on with you and they, and somebody recognizes, oh, that's Gene, because I got stopped a couple of times. Oh, that's Gene Banks, he all right, he all right. And they said, all right, Negro, don't, don't be coming around here no more. They let you go. <laughs> they let you go. You know, yeah. down these guys, pass. They don't you, pass. Yeah, you gotta pass. Even guys that play instruments, you know, just like some of the guys from Boyd Smith, I knew Boyd Smith and those guys, one of the guys that came up to the neighborhood, he was seeing a girl up there and they, they, they clamped him down. And then he started singing. They said, oh, that's, that's Gerald, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and they let him go. They let him go. That's how it was back in that time. Oh, well, I'm glad for that. That's just yes. Exactly. You know what, Big Tap? I don't think you have ever shared with our listeners your background mm. and your growing up. So yes. since you're here with your homeboys and everybody's sharing their, um, their childhood journey, why don't you share today? And bring us up to speed on, on your background. Uh, I um, I'm born and raised in, in West Philadelphia. My uh, parents, my father, he was Jamaican background. He came here at an early age, from Jamaica, Kingston, Jamaica. My mother was from Philly, via down south, Virginia. And they met, uh, like around, I don't remember the year, but. They got married at an early age. I think my dad was 23 and my mom was 18. And they got married and they started their life there in West Philadelphia. And my dad, oh man, you know, the Caribbean people back then, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna tell you guys a deep story because my dad, God rest his soul, he's deep. And Larry can tell you stories that he knows that I've told him and he's a true story. You know, my dad was so deep. Caribbean people back then, they used to do everything themselves. They didn't have the technology. They didn't have the things. So you know what my dad, right? In West Philadelphia, this is a true story. I'm gonna tell the show, cause this is deep. My dad was making good money and raising us kids. He had businesses, yes, but he was also giving the women of West Virginia homemade abortions. Mm. Wow. He was, he must have gave, they, his friends that are still alive, 90 years old, and my uncle and people used to tell me stories of my dad was a bad boy. And he never heard of none of those women. And he, they said he had to give over a hundred of them. Wow. And, and you know, and, and he knew how to do that, I guess from Jamaica, I don't know how he knew how to do that, but mm -hmm. it, was, it was crazy. But I'm born in West Philadelphia and my dad died at a young age. I was uh, 14 years old and um, I was, you know, we were forced to, you know, struggle. My mom was trying to do, she never graduated high school. So she went back to school, got her GED and went to Cheney State with my younger brother. Mm -hmm. and, Graduated on the, my mom is incredible. Jacqueline Tapper's her name. She's a, she knows Larry and uh, <laughs> God bless her. She's she's amazing. And um, how many kids? Tap five. It's it's. So me. she raised five kids on her own and went. Yeah, to my little brother was one. My sister was uh, seven, I think. I was fourteen when my dad died. My older sister was 17 and my brother Craig was uh, 13. Yeah. And he died a freak accident or a motorcycle accident. So she was forced to raise the kids on her own. The house yeah. went up to the carousel and we moved in the hood. That's when we moved on 60th and Vine, Gene. Mm -hmm. uh, my dad owned a, a barber shop. He was a barber and he had a bar at a bright spot on 59th and Cala Hill, right across from the Callahill, the uh, bus depot, the SEPTA bus depot. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, like I said, she went back to college, but I was getting in trouble. That's when I was introduced by my uncle, Gene. Lee, check this out. This is a true story, guys. I was introduced. I don't know if this is even appropriate for the show, but because I never told Gene, but Gene probably knew. But I was introduced by my uncle who coached Gene in basketball to marijuana and cocaine. Yeah, Ralph Rice. Ralph Rice, Coach Rice. Mm -hmm. 
Coach <laughs> Rice was my uncle, and he entered, and we used to party. And I was getting in a lot of trouble. So my mom got with some pastors up in upstate Pennsylvania. I went to a school for boys. They got me out of Philly because Philly was too much for me. I was having too much fun and I was going down the wrong path. Best thing that ever happened to me because that group home sent me to sent me to a school for boys in Williamsport, PA. And I had came back to school and went to Overbrook for a year and lived, but I found my way back to go back upstate because I saw when I came back home, it was worse. So from there, I went to college. I got a scholarship, went to college, and I winded up in New York. So that's how I got New York. But well, Tap, you hear the, the common thread between your story, Gene's story, and mine is all strong mothers, strong black yep. women. Yep. You know, yep. I mean, <clears throat> Yes. I just never wanted to disappoint my mom. And obviously I was afraid of my dad. So, you know, that was enough motivation for me to try to be successful. Here, here. Yeah, I, I had the pleasure of meeting Larry's mother, a beautiful woman. And I, and I, I kind of feel as though she loved me too. But his father, those were some, <laughs> of, the, uh, those were some of the deepest conversations I ever had with my life with Larry's dad. I don't know, Gene, if you had the, the privilege and the pleasure to sit down in Larry's basement in Mount Clay, New Jersey with his dad, but I did a couple of times and hear the stories about Major League Baseball when he was in there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is all new to me. I would never think it because, you know, Gene, I, you know, I knew presidency. I don't know why, but I just never, I always, looked it off. I, I never really dealt with it like mm -hmm. that. It off, you know, but when, you know, his father told me what he was going through and stuff like that, you know, it, it makes you angry, but, you know, you have to make some decisions in your head. Larry's dad forced me to make decisions of how to live my life as I've gotten older and what to, uh, look out for and what not to look out for. Like Eugene, I know you've been going through it when you moved to the South, playing for Duke with the, the threats and everything. Um, I think we were just three men that were intelligent enough to avoid uh, a lot of situations and just know to give our heart the best way we knew how because our family, our mothers and fathers we were, way, we were raised right. right. Yeah. Because of the way we were raised, that's what we give out. That's what we present to other people. And believe me, guys, I told Larry well, one time I brought a, uh, I think me and my brothers and sisters changed my mother. Because one time I brought a, a white woman to my house and my mother said, don't you ever <laughs> bring this woman to my house. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Believe it. She, she embarrassed me. You know, and this is my mom. I love that. But I did not know Jackie was pre president, Larry. I didn't oh, know. But she they come from a different time, man, than we do. So it's a, it's a and different. And that girl was so nice. She was so sweet. Yeah. And I, I said, and so I told my mom, because I was crying when I had to walk the girl to the bus. Because, you know, I was walking. I was She was working up at the main line, Gene. And I bought her from the place I was working where I was making steak sandwiches. And she liked me. Nice, you know, white woman. First time, really. And I brought her to the house to meet my family. I thought I had a cool family. Mom was a half. Mom was I know it's not back then. Nope. <laughs> and, uh, and I had to tell mom, I had to tell her, mom, don't you ever embarrass me like that and don't, I don't, blah, 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 you know, and I didn't even realize, you know, it was just that I had to tell, you know, but then I realized that my mom was open-minded and I got to her. Larry, as you, when you met, as I moved on and moved to New York and did a lot of things and was exposed to more uh, biracial or, 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 or different nationalities and stuff, I real I realized that my mom changed too because yeah. of my because of my positivity about everyone, all right. nationalities, Spanish, Latin, black, 
everybody because I was right. exposed to it. In Philly, right. it's black, white. You in the hood. Me and Gene was black. We was in the hood. The white boys in Woodland Avenue and all around surrounding us, they wasn't having it either. But, you know, <laughs> but, you know, only time we really dealt with each other was in sports. And then in sports, you can tell that it was some hatred there because they was, they was, they was trying to hurt us. Yeah, you know, yeah. In basketball, listen, Larry, we was dealing with some, we, you know, upstate Pennsylvania, everywhere. That's so what tell you, me, you guys tell me, how many students would be at Overbrook in West Philly? What would your graduating classes be? 3,000? Mm, they, they, they were pretty big. They were pretty big. Um, and what, what's the percentage of white to black? We had two, we had, <laughs> throughout the whole school, we had two whites in it, a boy and a girl. two whites, okay. And what about you, Tap, at Overbrook? What would, how many whites? Maybe about six. Okay, so yeah, I understand. And what about Maybe Compton about there, young lady? <laughs> well, for my year back in 1880, when I went to high school, <laughs> um, I think our whole school, I mean, we had a student body of about 800. Okay. And, Maybe there were two or three. All right. So yeah, your your guys, at least schooling upbringing is totally different than mine. As Tap used to make fun of me and call me a Huxtable because I went to school with white people, you know? So like there was no way it was 99% black and 1% white. It wasn't the opposite, but it was a lot closer to the opposite than it was to what you guys, you know, experienced. And it's it's just interesting to me you know, because all we are is a product of our environment. Yep. And right. it's, it's just interesting to me how we all come to a certain point in our lives where we realize, you know, you treat people the way they treat you. And, you know, but when, from what you come from and how you arrive at where you, you know, what you become as a, a young man or a young woman, it's, it's an interesting journey. Definitely. Yeah, because I, I tell you, you know, I've, I experienced busing. In junior high school, we yeah. were at, we moved back to West Philly, but then they somewhere along the line they had this program in Philadelphia right. about right. busing. <clears throat> no one talked to me about it. I don't know if they even talked to my dad about it. They said this is what, what's going to happen. So we left from West Philly on BB Comedies on Fifty Second and Greenway Avenue, all the way to go all the way down to Second and Mifflin, South Philly, which is a thirty five maybe thirty five minute drive by bus or more, and they did that every single day. That means I went to Furness Junior High School, which was predominantly white. Right. You know, I, I got chosen out of maybe 30 or 40 kids with the, because of my, my academics or whatever the case may be, were very good. Uh, I got chosen as one of those kids to go down there. And that's where my experience of going to Furness Junior High School, experiencing busing uh, day in and day out uh, from West Philly to South Philly. So that it's interesting how our, our, our lives, even with the, yeah. the ladies with Lori, what they've gone through and so forth. We've all had some journeys, man, that have been that that made us even from our environments, from our families. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and I'll say this, and I, I say this to everybody. I says I'm proud that I, I, I was born black. You know, I was yeah. I was so happy that I was born black yeah. to have those experiences, different experience, man. When white folks will nothing against. I mean, we we were raised to love all people, but right. I'm not. I'm not. My eyes are not closed to systemic racism and things that happen and right. were happening. But we, we like the three of us, I'm sure we knew how to adjust and how to, to watch for those pitfalls and step this way. But you ain't going to punk us either now. You know, we're nope. going to be respectful, but you ain't going to punk us because if you put us in that corner, then you're going to see a side that you don't really want to see. But we're mm -hmm. not going to go there because we're representing our families, our moms, our dads. And our, right. That's why we act right. It's, that's what it's all about. Yep, I agree. And, and I also would like to say this, Lori, one thing about these two brothers, you know, it, it, like Gene was just saying, you know, we know the difference. And, and it's their attitude, ladies. They're not angry. A lot of my friends, for whatever reason, and I'm not saying that they shouldn't, they don't have a reason to be, but I feel as though we as black people should be smarter and stronger enough to get over these adversities, adversaries of being angry. You know, don't you you don't want to keep that anger inside or that, you know, because we're gonna see a lot of things, but to really grow and get further, 
you have to just try to show that you are a, a person of God and God teaches us different ways to be. He doesn't teach us to be angry. You know what I mean? He just mm -hmm. don't we be angry. And I know having two older mentor brothers like Larry and Gene, I'm in the right path and I'm with, around good company. So I just, I, I feel blessed about that. Coming out of a city, you don't know. Philadelphia, ladies, might be the worst city in the United. Unfortunately, it's, it's called the city of brotherly love, but it's it's bad. Philly it's gotten a little better. It's got it's gotten a little bit better, but it, but it's gotten better, but gotten worse. I mean, when you go to Philly, you know you got the historic downtown Society Hill. It looks all nice. You know how that is, Tap. But then when you go spread out, now you got North Philly. Then you got their areas in our West Philly now where West Philadelphia, which most people, they're going for that gentrification thing where people are moving back in, getting these homes, you know, mm -hmm. and they're trying to redo the neighborhood. So that's going through a change. And, that, and that, that's systemic racism that they did with that because I remember West Philly was a night, nice, you know, those houses up there in Winfield, there were some nice houses, you know, when we were, when we were coming up. Right. You know, they were nice houses, bigger houses, nice backyard, different in South Philly, different in North Philly. But uh, now it, it has changed so much. And, and like you said, there were some rough spots, but there were some good spots during that time. And the thing is, when we try to talk to our young people now, there was community in a lot of ways. We screw up, but we had guys that put a foot up and behind. We had aunts and moms that, that showed love. People cooked dinners every day back in them days. I don't know what they're doing nowadays. Everybody's going fast food. But you know, you you had to come in and have dinner, and mom cooked. You know, throw down. This millennium now with new with new, the young people now, what they're doing, they're getting something real fast. They're going to Whole Foods. They're going wherever. Okay, they're not sitting down doing what the ancestry of things of making that nice home cooked meal to for their children now. Oh, that's everything's so fast. That's so true, G. Oh man, that, I mean, I never even really thought about that, but that's you making a great point there, man. You are making a great point there. A it's just amazing. For the panel, Gene, I have a question for the panel, actually. How did the crack epidemic affect Philadelphia and your gentlemen's hometowns? Can you recall that at all? Well, I'm going to let, let uh, Tap talk for, because I, I left. Uh, I, was in, I was in Durham, and uh, then I went to the pros. I was in San Antonio, and I was in Chicago. So I pretty much was kind of moving away from that Duke and that. Uh, but you know, it, it's like everywhere else. Once, once they got a dose of that, it was, it, it tore people up. Yeah. I mean, people were, people were stealing uh, from each other. Um, uh, it, it, it was, when I came back to Philly and saw it, uh, it was very, very scary, especially when you have a family member trying to steal from you and, and break in your house. Uh, and it just, it was one of those, those really major barriers that really started just chipping away at the foundation of the black family for sure. Right. Yeah. It, 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 it took, it took, it hit us like every other major city. Yes. It, 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 it stole people's soul. It, it hit, you went right to your soul. People had no soul. It was like zombies. It was like, they knew how that, that part of the business of money, crack and all that, they took the soul right out of the black people. It always affects the black. I mean, mm -hmm. the minority, let me just say minority, because our, our Latin brothers and sisters is part of it too. So just let me say it always affects the minorities, but it just it just robbed us of our soul. We some soulful people, we, we some loving soulful people, but a big chunk of us got robbed of our, our soul during that crack. Yeah, yeah. well, you, you had to crack, and then the, I'm gonna tell you when we had the gangs, Tap, you remember this. When the gangs are going, when we were young, you know, you know who quelled the gang situation? Black, the Muslims. The Muslims came through and grabbed them brothers up and, 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 and stepped to them and told them brothers, listen, this is you shouldn't be doing this and that, blah, blah, blah. And it took out 45% of the gang. You yes, know, sir, and, but, I was, I, and you know what you know what's deep, y'all? The, the, this is life. This is a part of life, right? And what he said is, is definitely true because me and Gene, basically, I was from, I was at first I was from Birch Street, but then when we were forced to move, 
deeper into the city of West Philly, I became a member of the Moon Gang. And Gene mm. is from the Gene from the Moon. You know, we all from the Moon, lad. And you know, the gangs is like it, it, it was ridiculous. It, it, I mean, but it, unbelievable. I, I just, yeah. I just. I just lost my my chain of thought because it's just it's so deep. But anyway, um, I wanted to get back on something else after you uh, go back. Go ahead, Jackie. I, I lost my chain of thought. <laughs> I'm sorry. Thank you so much, Tab. I appreciate that. Laura G, I know you had a couple of questions on see on your list. Did you want to? I do. I in the pre-interview, gentlemen, we talked about your friendship and the importance of it in your lives. And today you've shared with us your backgrounds and, and your journey and how your lives have woven together. I'm interested from each of you wanting to know what have you valued most out of this three-way friendship? How has it helped and supported your life's journey? Hmm. Hmm. Well, I guess I would say that knowing these two gentlemen and having them be part of my life has been inspiration to me and also a learning experience for me. You know, I came from a town that's pretty cool town in Jersey and North Jersey, Montclair, but not as urban, obviously, as, you know, a city, you know, it's, it's suburbia. And there's some things that you just are not aware of when you come from the suburbs as opposed to the city. And it's just things that they grow up with, you know, having their eyes open to certain things that I wouldn't. So I think that awareness, that knowledge, that street knowledge, and the fact that they also had a burning desire to succeed, you know, it, not only did that inspire me, but it also interested me because it was a different um, experience than I, than I grew up with. So it, it was, you know, I met Gene at a very young age and, he was a man amongst boys. You know, he was, I guess, the way I would explain Gene's friendship to me is I, I saw what he did on that basketball court. I saw that it wasn't only about scoring. It was about making his team better. It was about winning. And, and that was the attitude. And that's the best way I can describe who he is. Even when he went to the pros, you know, it's about winning. And to be as good as he was and he could have taken a hundred shots a game. He didn't do that. He spread it out. He made his teammates better. And that was something that I noticed right from the beginning. And, you know, that, that speaks to a level of basketball IQ, obviously, but it also speaks to a level of maturity that there's something more important than scoring all the points and winning is, is probably the most important thing, but bonding with your teammates and, and, and involving your teammates is what I saw out of him. And as far as Tap's concerned, again, when I worked at the Hard Rock with him, he was a city guy. And there were things that he would see that I wouldn't see that I learned from him because he was a city guy. We were in New York City and he'd say, you know, you got to watch out for this or watch out for that. So I think the combination of their street sense, their city upbringing and their desire to succeed is what has uh, resonated the most with me as being their friend. Well, my, my thing with Larry was when I came to Duke, he was one of the one of the black contagion of few that I saw, and I felt good. I, I felt I don't know if you call it protected. I felt a little bit safe. It wasn't a lot of us, but the ones that I saw, the Mike Barneys, the Midnights, the, the, the Derek Pins, the Grant Cunningham, and Larry was with that same group. And those guys were my brothers and they, they protected me and they watched them even though they were thinking they feel they didn't, they didn't have to, they didn't need to, but, but they did. And that bond that we had at Duke around that whole situation and Larry don't know how important he was to that. Just, just him giving my, that hug and say, let's go Tinkerbell, let's get it going. Let's do, do what you gotta do. I took upon myself to know that I could not let them down. And I saw them doing their work not just on the field, but in the classroom and around campus and doing stuff. They kept me making sure that I had to keep pushing because when it comes to us as black folks and we're in a white environment, we have to make sure we do a job twice as twice better 
or, or, or act a certain way to be, you can't be acting out where all of a sudden they're going to put us on some probation or, or look at you a certain way. We had to really walk a certain type of line. But the one thing I did know, I had a little bit of power and they allowed me to spread my wings, but I didn't overact and act a certain way. And Larry was one of those guys, when I seen him and been around him, he made me feel as though I have to do this for the reason because I'm representing him. And he's, he's whatever he's doing, they, rep, they, they bringing me along. So that's what me and Larry's relationship, Tap, Tap and I come from the same hood, same neighborhood with the Moon Gang, Overbrook, West Philly. His, 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 his uncle was my coach, so we were connected. We were always connected through all that. So we probably, you know, through, through the facts, we grew up in that same street and grit and the whole concept. We grew up from that and we moved on and went out and we persevered. And that makes me proud of him that he continued to be perseverance and, and, and still have that love for himself and keep doing things. And that's, that's, that's why this thing's so special for me. That's beautiful. That's great. That's beautiful. And for me, with these two brothers, you guys don't understand. Like, um, I'm young, like I said, I'm a little younger than them, but when I met Larry, you know, Larry's 6'4. You know, I'm a big guy. They call me Big Tap, but I'm not <laughs> a big guy next to Larry. Larry's 6'4. Larry's older than me. Larry's intelligent. And he's just a different animal and he's well respected. Mm -hmm. And then, we all have the common denominator of sports. Gene and Larry, they're, they're both, Gene is what, 6'8", right? Gene 6'10"? Six, six, no, not 6'10", six, 6'8". Six, eight. Six, eight. Gene is 6'8". Yeah. So, you know, these brothers is my, you know, these, these are my boys. <laughs> but, you know, I'm like a young, I'm like a young, you know, they're young boy to them. So, Larry, it was, it, it's just unbelievable that you know, when I met him, that he um, he inspired me because he took me out to the baseball field. What Larry excels in is baseball. So when I got to know him, I, I played on the same team as him. Mm -hmm. And when I saw, the, what I saw was the other team when Larry would come to bat, the other team would go to the other baseball field way down on the other side of the you know, in Central Park. I said, what are they doing? Said, There's no way he's going to hit that ball that far. <laughs> we were playing softball. I swear to God, guys, true story. First of all, Larry, he's bow-legged. He come up to the plate. He looks like King Kong, you know? <laughs> so, so, you know what I mean? He has these glasses. He's intimidating. But then when you see the whole team just back up to the other field, it's like, this, this, this is bugging. And we worked together. I came with him. When they pitched that ball to him and he hit that first home run I ever seen him do, from right there I said, I'm not ever letting this, this is my man. Because sports, you know what I mean. Sports is something that you, you know, when you got a mentor in sports. And then he tested my knowledge of sports. And <laughs> I know a lot. You know, I'm from <laughs> Philly and I'm a sports guy just like him. And that's how we really got close. He got to know my family. I just brought in Larry like a big brother. I was always the big brother to Craig. I have a little brother, two little brothers. But Larry was my big brother. See, then Larry used to always tell me about Gene. <laughs> his, his, right? Yeah, because I guess I reminded him of Gene. I knew Gene, what, it had to be 15 years before I met Gene? Listen, I knew Gene, I knew, so, I, and then the thing about it, Larry didn't know, I used to go to Gene's high school games. I knew Gene's rival, um, Lewis Lloyd. Lewis Lloyd is my man, you know, and mm -hmm. all Gene's friends I knew, but me and Gene really wasn't equipped. It was just, I knew him, but I didn't. Right. And then when we got together, when, when we first discussed and got together and all that, I just knew, this, you know, they took yeah, we it to were bonded. Yeah, we were bonded. It's, just, it's all positive. It's all good. And, you know, these are going to be my guys for life. And, you know, these guys are, like you said, legends. You guys call them legends. 
they came on, you know, they didn't have to, you know, take their times out, you know. I think they did it just because I asked them. And that's a good feeling, man, you know. Most because definitely. They, you know Most what definitely. I mean? That's a, And I, I just want to thank you, Larry, man, for bringing Gene on. And, you know, I know Lori and, and Jackie appreciate it, but, you know, you know, you're going to make this show even better. You know, people that see this show tonight, they're going to see how real it is and see how, you know, you guys are. And uh, But I want to ask you some more deeper stuff when, if Lori, I'm going to let Lori and uh, Jackie ask some questions first, but I want to ask you some stuff. We're going to get into some Michael Jordan. I know you might not want to hear it, Gene, but I want to hear I want to ask you a couple <laughs> uh, the Michael oh, Jordan. Oh, yeah, I, I, I played with him three years, so I, I, yeah, I pretty yeah. much know. But I, I wanted to add on to you with, with that. Larry. Larry was, you know, besides his his, his academic growth and his honor rolls and, and the stuff he's done, Larry was a hell of an athlete, and he played multiple sports. You know, not just the baseball, but he was he was a hell of a football player. I love going to the games and watch him play. So, and Larry could play all these sports. That's that was the interesting thing about him. So I wanted to let say so that, that that kept us even more connected because then. He'd come to game support me. I'd go to football game support him, baseball yep. game. So we always kept supporting each other through that situation. I just wanted to put that addition in there too. Yep. Oh man, he, 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 are you kidding, Gene? No, he's a he's definitely a three man. And well, um, I'll tell you one of the one of the one of the best nights of my life is I was in L.A. and the Spurs were playing. I don't even know if you remember, Gene. The Spurs were playing at the Forum at this time. Yep. And I got in touch with you. You gave me tickets, and I went to the game, and you played a great game. And uh, it was during showtime and all that. I don't remember who won, but I just remember my boy had a good game. And it yeah, was a great yeah. Game. It was a good night, man. <laughs> me and Maz used yeah. to go. We used to go head to head because we came out of school at the same time too. Yeah. So. Oh yeah. yeah. One. That's one of the best high school classes ever for basketball. Oh yeah, unbelievable. Yep. Albert King, Magic, yep. Magic Johnson, Orlando uh, Jeff- Woolrich. Jeff Darnell Lamp, Valent- Darnell yep. Valentine, right? Yep. Jeff Lamp, Jeff Rulin, Cliff yep. Robinson, yep. Uh, Kelly Chapuka. Kelly Chapuka came out that time. Yep. They say yep. P- people that listen, they 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 know some of these names. Yeah. What did you get picked, Gene? You know, I I got picked in the twenty eighth. I was the twenty eighth pick. I was projected to go three or four. But you know, uh, my last game, we, we, we had a game in the NIT with Coach K. But Coach K's first year at Duke University, who's now the winningest coach in basketball, that was my senior year because my coach had left a year. The one that recruited me had left the year before. And K came in and we played. And guess we had to, we had to go to the NIT. And guess who we, had, who we got picked to play in the first round of NIT? An HBCU school named North Carolina A&T. Yeah. Okay, that was the greatest time for me because I was cracking all week to white folks at the scratches. Y'all ain't seen nothing yet. Tickets open. <laughs> These black folks gonna come in here. They gonna rock this place. <laughs> I said, Cameron Indoor Stadium. Yeah, y'all rock it. But tickets are open, so you gonna see A and T come up in here with that band and yep. all. This, oh, y'all ain't seen nothing yet. Uh, so uh, we had the game. I started out seven for seven the first half. I went up to block a shot. My legs got cut from under me. And I came from like 10 feet up high. I reached down. I snapped my wrist, my Nick Rickler bone in my wrist in half. Oh, that I was the NIT game you did that, Gene? That was the NIT. Yep, oh, okay. snapped it right in half. I, it was a, And I got up, and it was just shaking. And I still wanted to play. I didn't think, I, I don't know if I was in shock or whatever. I was like, yeah, it didn't matter. And I snapped my wrist in half and the draft you know the season's about to be over the draft is coming up in three to four months so i i, I went from being baby picked third in the draft fourth and yeah. to 28th but it was a great thing that i did go 28 i went to the san antonio spurs with the great ice man right wow. well, you, you played with the ice man wow yeah four years five years mm-hmm. yeah I have a question for you, gentlemen, because, you know, this is we do where social consciousness meets the arts, and there's so much going on in the nation right now. I just wanted to ask one question that we asked. Larry, what does the word justice mean to you? Oh, that's a, that's a good one, Jack. Um, well, what I would like it to mean is, is doing the right thing. But I guess... 
what it means today is what people can prove or what people can make you believe. But I, th I think justice is just, you know, the, the feeling of, of, of being right, of doing the right thing. That's what it, that's what I want it to mean. I don't know if it means that today, but that's what I want it to mean. I appreciate that. And Jean, what about you, sir? What does the word justice mean to you? The government rules and amendments and policies are placed. We make government rules to the that we must abide by so that we don't have chaos, so we can be organized. We want to have these things because justice is talking about if a wrong happens, we want to make it right. But when it says if it's a justice that you're going to try to make it right, but you're going to skip around it and make it systemic to the point of we're going to do this justice for this group, but not going to do it for that group. Now you got what you call injustice. So the justice person point of it is is about the 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 Bill of Rights and all these things that in the amendments. But Hello? more than anything else, when we're talking about the justice, justice is for supposed to be for the stigma. Uh, the concept for all people to be under and be abide by and be allowed to have, not just one group and the other group. So one gets the justice, the other one gets the injustice. No, justice is supposed to be about righteousness, period. Obviously, just doesn't happen. Hey, there we go, because it had gone frozen on Larry. It had. Hi, Larry, you're back. <laughs> Yay. I'm back. <laughs> there he is. Great. Yeah, because I heard your voice, Larry, but I didn't see your face. Yeah. yeah, it was frozen. Right. It was frozen. Okay, so good I got a face for radio, guys. You don't need to see me. <laughs> he's got How does that... hazel, he, he, he got them hazel eyes. He, he, he captivates the women. He's got those oh, hazel stop eyes. It. Stop uh, it. Mesmerizing. Yeah. Yes. Oh, Larry. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was a distant second to Gene at school. So that's all I could say. <laughs> I, well, you know, it, it, listen, when, when you go to college, and I'm sure you all. Gone, women are different than the guys hey, especially if, you're, if you're popular so to speak you know you you have a certain things happen you know you, 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 i don't know if you call it sowing your oats or just get out of your dating and so forth but i got locked down early you remember i got locked down early with uh lisa borders you know oh, lisa yes, borders, i do remember that mm -hmm. lisa borders was the WNBA commissioner a couple of years ago if you, laura if you don't yep. know who that is she was oh, okay. uh and, and she was a commissioner she knew the game so when you had that commissioner, she knew the basketball game because she would sit there and watch videos or film when, the, and she point things out. So she was a WA NBA commissioner and knew what she was talking about and knew what was all about. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hey, hey, listen, here's a claim of fame, Gene. Uh -uh. Did you ever see that Sex in the City episode with Larry in it? Oh my, really, Tap? Oh no, Tap. Oh, wait a minute. Hold on. Oh, my goodness. Tripping. You okay. got to find that for me. You got to find it. on Google. Okay, Google it. Google it, Rashad. Yeah, yeah. Kim, Kim Hold on. What am I Googling? Larry Doby Jr. on Sex in the City. Kim Cattrall. Kim Cattrall. They're in the um, locker room. So, Jackie, we have no secrets now. Is that what, that's what's going on here? <laughs> I'm, 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 we're almost finishing now. Yikes, radio. Remember, See? Larry, I told you tea time was coming. It's awful. Yeah, but Tap's kind of trying to start it sooner. <laughs> hey, listen, listen, listen. I got you. Whoever's got that, whoever finds that you got to send that to me. <laughs> For real. Y'all don't know. Oh, really? For okay, real. So then, then you guys make sure you see the movie Eddie when... Uh, Whoopi Goldberg is the first woman coach, and her assistant coach is none other than the king of the West Philly Speed Boys, Gene Banks. Ah, oh, okay. There we go. Okay. So here we go. You guys did not disclose your Hollywood uh, stardom in our free oh. interview. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, oh, so hey, Larry. Yes, Tap. Somebody just called and said, you're going to be getting so many calls. Yes, he is. <laughs> Sex in the City. And okay, listen, so it was Sex in the City, uh -oh. season two, episode one, labeled Take Me Out to the Ball Game. Ooh. Ooh. I don't like you. You're Get that team. Your job, Rasheed. No, I'm, 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 I'm going to write it down. You're saying you can't find that one. <laughs> it's a locker room scene. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Can, can, can you give it back to me again, season one? <laughs> no, it's season two, episode, episode uh -huh. one. Take right. me Jackson out to the, the ball game. 
Ooh, so Larry, I'm, 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 you've got yes. to tell us how did that come about? How yes. did you get a role on? Oh Sex goodness! All right, this is I don't want to bore you guys. Basically, since I was a little kid, Jackie, I loved the movies, and I always thought that I might want to do something in that vein as I got older. So, you know, life goes on. You go to college, you graduate. I played in the minor leagues baseball for a few years, got out of that, didn't know what I wanted to do. And started doing a lot of things, but I always had this kind of in the back of my mind that I wanted to try it. So I took some acting classes and, you know, then lo and behold, in New York City, you know, there's a ton of actors and actresses and directors and writers and just talented people and I met a, a bunch of people I played baseball with were actors and screenwriters and producers, directors, and what have you. Oh, you know, and I sort of expressed this desire to them. And, you know, so they said, well, you know, have you ever taken any classes? I said, okay. yes, I have. So I got a few um, auditions and I didn't get any of the parts that I auditioned for. And then I was on the road with Billy Joel, who I've worked for for over 20 years. And I got a phone call from a friend of mine who was a casting director. And she said, there's a part in Sex and the City that's perfect for you. Will you please audition for it? Yes. So I said, yeah, I will. So I came home off the road. I read for the part and I ended up getting it. And that was that. And then I did Sexy the Larry. Sexy Larry. <laughs> Yes, so yeah. do give us the deets on that. Details, details. It was wow. the second season, so it was it was uh, it was gathering a lot of support. It wasn't the juggernaut that it was, you know, near the end of it, but it was getting big. You know, Sarah Jessica Parker and uh, Kim Cattrall, Kristen Davis were there, and my scene just happened to be they were at a baseball game. Sarah Jessica Parker catches a foul ball from the new Yankee. They go by the locker room after the game to have the new Yankee autograph it and the door opens and I'm standing there out of the shower and I say a few lines and that was kind of it. Are you showing, you showing the body? You cheat. Some of it, it was cable. Oh, okay, okay. Not oh, the cheeks, not the cheeks. The cheeks, yeah, Mr. Cheeks, Lori. No cheeks. A little risque. Ah, he, he, had to, he had to tap. He, he, he had Let to me tap. get my iPhone. Let me pull up my Netflix, guys. He, he, had, he had to tap. He had to tap. <laughs> Sexy Larry. Now, Larry, Sexy did you Larry. continue? Have you done more roles? You know what? This the one here. Thing, let me tell you. After I got that part, I probably had, oh my goodness, maybe thirty auditions for all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I didn't get any of the parts. And the last one that I had was one for Oz. You guys remember Oz about the prison? Yes. yes. Oz. Okay, Love so Oz. it was for Oz. And when you, you know, first it was a cattle call. There were 100 of us. And then it was 60, 40, 20. It got down to 10. It got down to six. I was still there. So I was like, I'm going to get this part. And when you go read for a, a part, you know, you're an actor. They don't tell you what is involved you just read the lines and they decide so it got down to four people i ended up not getting it and a person that i know a friend of mine ended up getting the part that i was going for and i said you know how was it and he said well i had to kiss a guy <laughs> and i remember <laughs> thinking god was looking out for me because I, I don't know if i could have done that And when you're a professional actor that's part of your job and i would have had to do it and i don't think i would have been able to go through with it so was it tongue was it tongue yeah, it was a romantic kiss, Gene. It was like, Ooh. I was so glad I didn't get it. It, it would have skyrocketed your career. Crap, it might, it might have skyrocketed your career. Yeah, <laughs> well, I'd rather it skyrocket for different reasons. But to, to answer your question, Jackie, basically, if you're going to be an actor, you have to dedicate yourself to that profession 100%. And what would inevitably end up happening with me is when I would have an audition, I'd have to go to work. And I was like, wait a second, I'm not going to go to, to a work. I mean, I'm not going to go to an audition. Maybe I'm going to make some money when I can go to work and make some money. I wasn't going to be a starving actor. And because of that, you know, it didn't go anywhere. But I still sometimes think I might want to go back to it. But I don't know. But it was fun while I did it. And um, yes, yes. Yeah, it, was, it was a good time. <laughs> 
I think you should bring it back up, Larry. You I should go for it. Maybe like local community theater I, or something like yeah. that. Yeah. a clip. We have oh, a clip. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Watch out, we Larry. Have the clip. We, we have, have the clip. Yes. We have, have the that? clip. Hold on. Um, well, let me actually pull it up on, Look the, at Larry's face. on, on the other screen. Show this. Yeah. I can allow you to. Okay, listen. Yeah. If you're going to show uh, this receipt, you have you to get... also get jeans. Yeah. Going to be going <laughs> okay. Okay, oh, guys, yeah. it's coming. We're going to check hold it out. On, hold on. Oh my make goodness. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody. If you're under 17, you can't see this. Yeah, that's yeah. I'm a, it's it's actually age restricted. <laughs> Yeah. Cheeks. Oh, okay. Cheeks. 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 That's going to be your new name now, Larry. Cheeks. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Have fun, yeah. guys. You know what they say about payback, right? Yeah. Larry. Cheeks. <laughs> All right. Oh, oh wow. my God. <laughs> Man, you, you got you got this anticipate. Oh, I'm anticipation. Well, it's I'm crazy. gonna see if the professor thinks I have any talent. You know, if she's the head of the drama department at USC. Yeah, I Lord, think I, I, you've yeah, got I'll, talent. At least I'll get an informed critique. <laughs> this is awesome. I <laughs> <laughs> can't wait. Uh-oh. There it is. I know. Episode <laughs> two. He's sharing this. Oh, I love it. Listen to Gene. See, this isn't fair, Rashid. I had no idea this was gonna happen. <laughs> yo, yo, y'all, y'all don't, y'all don't realize this. I, I didn't even know. I didn't even know. You didn't know, Gene. No, he was, no. He was showing honest. the cheeks. You wasn't did it out. This is to amazing. It. Here we go. <laughs> hey, can, bring me some popcorn. Bring me some popcorn. You're not gonna be able to find it because it's a half hour show. Oh, 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 was that you? I just that saw. Him? I just saw cheeks. Hey. Whatever oh, wait a minute. <laughs> He's going to find it. He's going to yeah. find it. It's it. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but I couldn't help but wonder if they were any higher than finding a relationship that would last. Three innings, four beers, and one shot. Oh, no. <laughs> oh no. I'm eating my popcorn now. Rashid, you are a little too good at your job, brother. He's very good. Uh, I thank you for that. Well, honey, his I thank you for the comment. Over. <laughs> okay, um, it's official. You're drunk. Oh, I'm not drunk. I'm sedated for my pain. She's allowed to be drunk. She's going through a breakup. <laughs> Oh, hey, hi, excuse me. Huge Yankee fan. We don't mean to bother you, but my friend caught your ball. Uh, this is her. I'm her friend. Hi. And we were wondering if you'd sign it. Oh, the, the foul ball to the upper deck? Yes. I mean, yes. If it's not too... I'm a huge Yankee fan. I'm a lawyer. So if I don't sign it, you'll sue me? No. No. I don't know why I said that. <laughs> no problem. Give me the ball. Give him the ball. Oh. <laughs> so I assume, Gene, this looks a little more like my high school than yours, right? <laughs> yeah, <it is. laughs> most, most definitely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what do you do? She writes a column. A sex column. I've been going about that. You'd be surprised. There you go. Thank you. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> You're so cute. I'm going to ask him to the Dolce & Gabbana party. What? No, really, you can't. I don't know if it was the beer. Uh Uh-oh, Rashid might have messed up. I I don't know if he's going to get it or not. Oh, okay. All right. This is not fair. This is not the way this is supposed to happen. Why? You told me to get back in the game. Yeah, with some balding CPA Uh -uh. or other boring rebound guy. Nobody rebounds with the new Yankee. He may have got lucky. Uh -uh. He may have got lucky. Well, it says, let me see, what does it say? It says, yeah, this is, this might be, yeah. Risky. But a day of watching here we go. men Uh-oh. swing their big wooden bats. Oh, here it comes. Oh, here's the <laughs> There's Larry Darius. <laughs> that... <laughs> Larry. Look at him. <laughs> 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 
Oh, oh. oh. Be my... oh. Cheeks. Oh. Cheeks. Oh. Cheeks. Give it to me, Look at Larry. Bro. 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 I have a I have a more deeper respect for you than you have no oh. idea. <laughs> Stop it. Stop it. Listen. Hey, listen. Larry. Right. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. I'm, I'm getting on the floor bowing. I'm bowing. I'm bowing right now. I Stop get it, brother. I'm, get, I'm, getting on the, I'm getting on the floor. Right, watch. Right now. Oh, my hey. goodness. You, you want to you wow, see I this? Can, watch. I did too. Yeah, but she didn't, she didn't get to hear my line, so I don't know what she thinks now. I, I probably, I don't know. Anyway, uh, hey. can we get on something else now, I, Lori? I, 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 I think you should go back. You should yeah. do another bowing. I'm bowing. I'm bowing. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Gee, it's ridiculous. <laughs> Okay, now, Rasheed, you have to find the clip with Whoopi Goldberg and Gene from the movie Ooh. Eddie. Ooh, Lord have mercy. Oh, that was great. Okay, that was on, awesome. On, that, was that, was, that was that was awesome. Hey, Larry. That really, 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 really was. Let's see. Let's see. Go nervous, Look, our Zoom you, room is just la is, is supporting you, Larry. You have not hey, understood. Ha, ha, ha. Good stuff going on there. Oh, oh my God. God. You see, man, you see. That was awesome, my boy. This is all Tap's fault. Gerald Tap, you're all your fault. That's my girlfriend, my Meg, all the way from Phoenix, Arizona, was like, oh, we. Yes. <laughs> okay, so hold on. Facebook is just uh, Now, what am I looking here, for? Larry. You're looking for the movie Eddie with Whoopi Goldberg as the first female <laughs> basketball coach, and her assistant coach would be none other than Gene Banks. So Gene, I'm, tell I'm, us I'm, how did you how did you get that role with Whoopi Goldberg? Uh, I was in North Carolina. And my my old agent from from the pros called me up, and he said they were he wasn't my agent anymore because I was doing some stuff overseas. But uh, I was home. He said you need to go to Charlotte. They, they're going to be filming this film, and they want you to audition for it. <clears throat> I told him I told him right off the bat, I'm not going there. Man, it's going to be thousands of people there. It's going to be crazy. I'm not even gonna waste my time. He says, what you got to lose? Go see Mark Finn, Finn Cannon and go down there and check it out. So with a couple more prod, prodding to me and so forth, I said, what, what I got to lose? So I went down to Charlotte. They had the whole Marriott blocked off and uh, they had tons of people everywhere. I get there, uh, he gives me this, this index card. He's got this tripod and this little camera and I stand in front on, this, on, this, on the X and read, this, read this, these lines. And once I finished reading the lines, she says, thank you, goodbye. <laughs> and, I'm yep. like, exactly. and I'm like, I'm looking around like, okay, what's next? Nothing, you go. I left. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it was, it was which, people all over the place. Which scene am I looking for in the movie, Eddie? There's uh -oh. a couple. I'm, I'm, I'm in the movie pretty much all through the movie. There's, oh, a, there's, well. an, apartment, there's an apartment well. scene. There's a scene when on, on the bench. There's a part where she comes over... And she's getting ready to sit down. She she first gets the job as the as the uh, sit, as a, the honorary coach. They bring right. her down. She wins the ticket. And she comes down, and that's when she comes over and she's looking to sit down. And I I tell her to move. I, I give her the nod to sit your ass down. <laughs> it was a good scene. It's like right in when she gets the honorary uh, agreement to where she comes down to the floor and they got, she's going to come and sit on the floor with Dennis Farina. Dennis Farina is the the coach at the time. From she from Chicago, Gene? No, nah, she's from New York. No, no it's Farina from Chicago. Yeah, she yeah. We, we, yeah. I, I, I cry every time I, I, I spend time with him because we had a great time uh, during the movie. Uh, it was awesome. It was awesome. Mm -hmm. Slide down. Oh, okay, keep moving. <laughs> keep it moving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the tea time, Lolo. It's the tea time. It is the tea time. Oh, now, now, now all of a sudden, Rasheed can't find this one now. <laughs> <laughs> hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> now he can't find it. Don't go to that one. Go further. Yeah, like I said, go, you can go further up. Uh, okay. Okay. I'm trying to remember what scenes. Okay. Yeah, the car scene is not. We did apartment scene. Go further back up. Uh, right about. Keep going. Uh, you can go to that one. Let's try that one. That was That's the trailer, though. Uh, oh, okay. You want this one? Oh, that's that's yeah. the entire movie. No, they want that. No, we don't want that. No, no. Nah, uh, hold on. Hey, Gene, did you yeah. get did you get the uh, residual checks every once in a while in the mail? Yeah, I for for a while there I did. I I, I got yeah. a couple of because I was really I was really supposed to be I was really supposed to just get fifty dollars when right. I finally so well here's the thing they they had me come back another week so they wanted me to try out for 
uh, audition for another one. The, the part that John Sally got, that's what they wanted me to try out for. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, then the following week, they asked me to come and try for another one. And then a week went by again, and they called me again. So I was uh -huh. like, okay, what's going on? I mean, I drove up there. I was in the place maybe, what, 10 minutes? Right. You know, max. Right. Uh, and, and I sat down, and, uh, and they had me sit down and talk in front of Steve Rash, who was a director. It's like, it was like a Spanish Inquisition. Mm -hmm. So I'm sitting mm -hmm. there, they, they had me read two lines, blah, 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 in this room. And he says, okay, thank you, cool, no problem, I'll see you later. So I get up, I go to the door and I'm going, I gotta make some kind of scene. I wanna be in this movie, let me be the janitor or something, you know what I mean? Let me do something. <laughs> right, right, right. And I go, I go out the door and Whoopi's coming in I don't know if she was, she was just walking through because this was a special conference room. But as I'm walking, I'm like, I got my head down. I said, oh, I guess this ain't work out. This girl comes running down the hall. And she said, Mr. Banks, Mr. Banks. I says, oh, what's the matter? She says, I said, what, what's this? She says, here, take this. I says, what is it? She says, take this. It's all, it's all in there. It was a brown, uh, um, you know, brown envelope, big one. It was, it was uh, packed. And I, I was like, okay, I'm opening it up. I looked at it and it says, be here, it was Saturday, Friday, it was Friday. It says, be here early Monday, get your room, go get your get your car situation. We have we have casting call at five o'clock a.m. There you go. I went into the bathroom and I broke down and cried. I ain't gonna lie, <laughs> I broke down and cried. Uh, because see what happens is that when they, they when they first initial had the coach, Dennis Farina was a coach and then there was yep. Richard Jenkins. But they, you know, at NBA, you got more other coaches. So they really added me on to the script. They right. really added me on to the script. So that's how I got that. They said, you were perfect for it. We love your facial expressions, all that. Because I didn't have a speaking part. But right. um, I was in that thing. And I was there for the whole two months. They took mm -hmm. care of me. It was amazing. Whoopi was great. Whoopi came to me one time. Because Whoopi, where she goes, she had this game called Centipede. You know that, that, that game called Centipede? The that video game? Played? Yeah, the video game. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She had that, she has that flown wherever she goes, centipede. So it was, and we took over the whole Coliseum. Uh, I mean, you guys know about some of those things. I mean, they got the, the back for cold food. They got the upstairs. Yeah. They got, it's food everywhere. It's food yep. everywhere. Um, so I walked by and this is the first time she's not with an entourage. They said, Mr. Banks, get in here. And I was, you know, I stayed out of her way because she's a big star, you know. And, right, you know, right. So um, I go in and she jumps in my ass. She says, listen, listen. We're all, what, just don't, you walk like you're scared and you're worried. So we're all family here. You just chill out, just enjoy this and just have, cause we're family, you know? And that's when she was putting a patch on. She was trying to stop smoking. So she put mm -hmm. the patch on and she said, take my game. And if you, and if you fuck my game up, I'm whipping your ass. And she left out. <laughs> but I'm, I'm in her room, her little private, and I'm playing, I'm smiling cheek to cheek. I'm like, yeah, Whoopi likes me, yeah. <laughs> you know, so, um, and from then on, they gave me an awesome suite. They, they gave me a, a rental car, Mercedes rental car, and all of that, man. And it went, it went from getting the fifty dollars to uh, getting a salary. But the thing yeah. was, they, they I had to get the SAG, write down the SAG yep. paperwork yep. and all that yeah. stuff. Yeah, uh, yeah. And then I did speak in one part, and they said they had to take it out because then it was going to be another process with the the paperwork and all that stuff. So uh, yeah. I wound up making about about twenty five thousand. Nice. In the intro. That was pretty nice. And plus, plus some extra Excuse money. And I had so much fun because all the guys knew me from when I played. You know, Excuse all me. the guys that were in the movie, they knew me from when I played. And uh, I was there for the whole two months. You know, we went to we went to Winston Salem. We came back. We had some days of breaks. But I was pretty much always being. I was always even when I wasn't in in scenes. They loved for us to be. They loved for me to be around. We ate at twelve, one o'clock. We rented out a restaurant. We were eight. At twelve and one o'clock at night, and that's when we, they always wanted to have that bond. Who were the, you know? who were the pro players there? I know Sally was there. And Dwayne Shintis was there, right? Yeah, Sally. Dennis came in for a day. He was in. He was out. Dennis Robin was in. Right. Uh, a lot of guys. They, they brought him in. They, they just got him right out. Right. Mm -hmm. in right out. Right. Uh, I was just. I was so thankful that I was able to be there for that long. Man, it was. It was. It was. It was awesome. It was the greatest experience. And then me and Whoopi's brother became very close. Mm -hmm. And we were when we were going, they they were going to leave to go to Montana to film another movie. And Whoopi was telling them, tell Gino to come on. He, he's gonna go, he's gonna go with us. <laughs> and uh, and I was gonna go, but at that time my wife started getting ill. 
She had, okay. she had, she had the multiple sclerosis and, and right. it, 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 it affected her. So, uh, uh, I made a decision I wasn't going to do it. Also, I was yeah. going to take it, take it on and do that. And, right. and lo and behold, two years after that, she passed away. Gotcha. Sorry. Yeah. So sorry. Okay, so Jackie, do we have any film on Mr. Tapper maybe and his uh -uh. acting? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you are on here as the Knicks assistant coach. I think the only thing I can probably pull up would be the trailer, but... Um probably be it um if you're in the trailer or not um, i mean we can check it out let's let's just see, see what you can okay. see they, 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 and they can see it later they can see it later yeah yeah oh Let's man that's my show. that's my gene banks highlight thing you saw <laughs> yeah i see that <laughs> oh my that. god that means yeah that's all right cool. so uh, let's let's look at the, let's pull up the trailer <clears throat> Because there's also the, that black hole scene, which I think that was kind of <clears throat> okay. So let's actually see this. Let's let these folks see it too. Okay. Do -do. Home of the legendary New York Knicks. Bailey, you're going to try something new tonight, like trying to coach? But this season, the Knicks suck. It is the NBA, buddy. No buttheads allowed, but you keep coming back. Then fate. It's anyway, sad because this is to be honorary coach true the now. Lent them a hand. <laughs> Look at that. She's good as gold. The fans love her. Hey, you with the dollar ninety nine rug on your head? Would you get out of my way, please? You are not a coach. You're not a player. Looking like a little rope. Nobody thought she could. There you go. What are you doing? I'm walking the ball. About damn time. Now she's in their face. Oh, what is wrong with you? What you telling Tyler? On oh, their case. Pass the ball. What are you, the black hole of basketball? You gonna let her call you a black <laughs> hole? Not a hole, a black hole. What's a black hole? A black <laughs> hole is a theoretical object in space. And finding out. Teams got not to play. Bad shots, bad codes. Bad bad if her men have the equipment. You can't possibly be that stupid. To go all the way. Yo, hey, Sting, I went out with your mama last night. <laughs> You don't want to hustle. You don't want to do anything. <laughs> Whoopi Goldberg. That, that, that part was was one where my man my man was naked, and that wasn't really supposed to be in a movie, and he <laughs> and his towel and his towel dropped. And, oh shoot! But 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 his, his thing wasn't. I, I, I know we gotta be careful, mm -hmm. but his thing wasn't really like it was small. It was small. Okay, wait a minute. Oh wow. <laughs> and, 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 yes. Yeah, his thing uh, thing was small. Oh okay. Oh, so I um, uh, he. Uh, oh, nah, I, I mean, I would hope he wasn't at full attention, especially in a room full of men. I would. Hope. Oh yeah. Oh, he, oh, he got. Listen, he got roasted, oh, bro. Bro, he got roasted. He got <laughs> roasted, and that was the part that they and, and they they kept that part. That was not what we're supposed to do. And Rupi just said, "Oh my God!" She says that, little, and she. It was a funny thing. It was so funny that they that that was not really supposed to be the part in that scene. Yeah. And, and he got roasted. He's like saying, "What you know? Listen, I'm not as well endowed as I I, I got felt short. My parents felt short on me, so he took it in stride. <laughs> he took it in stride." But yeah, it's oh, a good yeah. movie. You, you have to see the whole movie. It's, it's, it's a good movie, though. It's a pretty good movie. I am definitely going to check out Ed. <laughs> yeah, we, have, we, 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 have, we have some scenes in there where I'm in there. I'm in there a lot. So it's, it's, it, I, I had so much fun doing it. Yeah, I, and I see why those people, movie stars, are so, what do you call them, divas? Because they gave, they gave me a, a, a groom person. And you know, I had a person, when they say cut, my makeup person and a grunt. So I'm not even the star. So when they, when they cut, okay, the grunt, the, the, the groom person comes over and takes off my, 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 my jacket, touches me up, blah, blah, blah. The grunt other person has me, asks me what I want, water, food, whatever. And they zip off and get it. I had two people on me and I'm not even a star. So, and that was throughout the whole movie. And I told the dude, I said, listen, why don't you just go ahead and chill? You know, don't, don't worry about it. He said, Gene, if they don't see me working, 
I won't be working. <laughs> you know, so I was like, you know, I, I want to, you know, don't worry about it. I'm good. I'm, he said, no, I have to do this. He said, if they don't see me doing it, I want to I have a job. So I am your personal assistant. So that was, I, I learned some stuff when it comes to uh, movies and, and how yep. they treat the actors and so forth and why mm-hmm. a lot of them act like they act. Yeah. Spoiled as hell sometimes. <laughs> yep. <laughs> But it was the most fun. It's the most fun ever. That's, that's good. That's time. great. I, you know, you I know. didn't expect tea time to start this early, but I think we should <laughs> we should keep going with this flow. So well, I am so interested in knowing, Gene. You dropped that little nugget of the Playboy Mansion. Right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, <laughs> this is tea time. This is tea time. Okay. I, I think we want to know what was <laughs> one of the wildest things you experienced at the Playboy Mansion? What was interesting was when we went in and it went in the back, the, the, the grassy part, and, and it was like, it wasn't an old crowd with a lot of people, but the women were, you know, they were in the bikinis and everybody was, or, or their nice uh, long robe, whatever. It was very classy. But what I felt was really interesting was we were sitting down and three or four of them sat and talked and they were talking about being veterinarians, doctors, and they're sitting there and we're talking. They says, you're really astute, you know, and, and we're having this serious conversation and no dis, no disrespect, no lie, but they, I mean, they were vol- voluptuous. I mean, they were, oh my goodness, I'm 17 years old. My biggest problem was I was sitting down while the four of them around and, and we're talking, having these conversations that are really awesome, you know, just talking about life and so forth. And all of a sudden, I start to feel a little bit of pressure, a little bit of rising. Can I say that? Is that? I, and and <laughs> that's so okay to sitting, say. You can oh, say that. Oh my that's God! He he started getting to his boiling point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So and then she comes by and she sits on she sits on my thigh, my lap. She says, uh, she says they're saying you might be coming out to California, and, and, and she's making it worse. She's sitting on my lap. She's got on a white bikini, top and bottom, and she's. And she's a sister, dark skin, pretty black. Oh my goodness. And she's sitting on my lap and she's playing with my, my nose and saying, well, if you come to California, I will be seeing you again. Now, you know, my, I, I'm, I'm, I'm about to raise Soldier is at attention. I, I, got, I, got, I got my legs crossed because I'm making sure that I'm gonna keep them you know, locked in. So right. you don't swing up. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm sweating bullets. I'm telling you, I'm sweating bullets. So they get up and they, they had to, one had to lead the other one. And then one sat there and looked at me because she must have sensed something. I couldn't get up. I, I just said, I said, no, I, I think I need to sit here for just a little bit. And she says, uh, I forgot the guy's name. Would you bring some ice over here? <laughs> that was the funniest thing because she knew. <laughs> she knew. But that was amazing. Oh, my goodness. Oof, Lord, have mercy. I'll never forget that. I'll never forget that. Wow. You, I wouldn't forget that either. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool that's good that's beautiful you know it is. Mean? definitely i'm definitely. sorry go ahead Susie. oh no i'm just still so i I'm, i know it's tea time but i just have to ask one question so gene based on the environment and the tone that you experienced at the playboy mansion yes, mm-hmm. how do you think that relates to bill cosby and his um conviction of mm-hmm. of um drugging the, the women who were there. I'm going to break this down to you. Back in those days, they had that thing where they dropped them things called Spanish flies. You know, they, the girl had the little drink, you put this thing in there and, and they give them the Spanish fly or whatever, uh, what they call it, what they, they named it, what he was doing. They get woozy, they, they lay their head down. A lot of guys were in that time, that era were doing it. I never did that, but guys were doing that in that era. Bill didn't even have to do that. I mean, he had, he was connected. Him and Half were connected, and he could have go and, and and mess with the the Playboy girls anytime he wanted to. It was the ones he dealt with were the ones that were coming to him looking to get that break, uh, to talk to him in a serious mode. And they were young, they were attractive. That, so that seemed to be his thing that he liked. And when you get away with doing it once or twice, you keep doing it. So I love Bill Cosby, but that him doing that and keep doing it and getting away with it, and eventually it's going to come back to, as you say, bite you in the ass. Um, that's not cool. 
that's not cool. And, and and they did they they did a lot of that back in those days. It wasn't Bill was just the only one. There was a lot of those guys that were doing it. Girls would all get woozy. And next thing you know, she's out. She don't even know the guy's having sex with because she's knocked out. That was that era, what, six, seventies, eighties? Yeah, I'm whatever during the era did. of the Harvey Weinstein, Bill Cosby, if I went during that mm-hmm. era. Mm-hmm. Crazy. Yeah. And, and 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 everybody's trying to get a job, you know, they, you know, these young girls, they, it's not like they really want to do that, but you know, they're talking to it and you get caught up in the situation. Here he is, he can get a chance to me go for further, or I don't want to get him pissed off. You know, he played with the minds of someone that was vulnerable because we're trying they're trying their best to make it in the business, and they know you got the power to do it, and he utilized his power in the wrong way. That's where his punishment comes in because it wasn't just he just did it once or twice. He kept on doing it. And like I said, I love Bill in a lot of ways, but I didn't like the fact that that would happen. But And I think some of it was also overridden too, where some of it was factual. There's no doubt about it. And then some of them, you know, one or two may have been in there to, to ride along with it. But once you do dirt, you know, once you do dirt and injustice, uh, I'm, I'm not being a preacher or anything like that. You're going to get those things back, especially when it comes to doing things to women. And always going to come back because women are, they, you guys are you, not guys. You ladies are the product of of the universe. Y'all help reproduce what this world is all about. Y'all help reproduce this world. Appreciate that exactly. So you know, along those lines, I'm sure a lot of our listeners. We've spent as couple hours with you, gentlemen. Learned so much about you. We want to know a little more of your personal side. So what are your ideas of a romantic evening? Ooh. Let's start with Larry. Yes. Why? Let's start. <laughs> Larry's like, why? Yes, yes. Oh. Larry, right. well, Larry you, you had that hot, steamy scene. I know. Yeah. 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 I'm pretty sure you got so, um, tons of fame. Fa- Facebook is blowing up over here. You are the doctor. You are the doctor. You are the doctor. All right, listen. I am sorry. <laughs> No, Thanks, no, Rashid. no. I thank you, Rashid. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, listen. I'm on, you guys put me on a spot here. And basically what I'm going to say is this. I don't care where you are, what you're doing, how much money you got. It's about who you're with. Because if you're with somebody whose personality and spirit you like, it's going to be romantic whether you're sitting on the stoop in front of your house or whether you're out to a candlelit dinner or whatever it may be, more important on who the person is that you're with than where you are. So I, I know it's a boring kind of answer, but that's what's romantic to me is spending your time with somebody that you care about and respect and com- communicate with, not if you're sitting you know, in Rome, Paris, wherever it's more about the person that you're with bro with the cheeks you got you ain't got to say nothing <laughs> okay with the yeah, cheeks okay. you got you ain't got to say no you got to this is this is my boy here <laughs> green banks this is my boy and he's killing me well, okay, that's, that's Larry, I, I think show. that you got a long roasting road ahead. I think this <laughs> this uh, this is going no, to I'm revisit just, you for I'm a minute. I'm praising him, Lori. Lori, <laughs> Jackie, I'm, I'm I'm praising him. I'm, listen, Larry, look at Larry. I'm going. I'm going. I'm starting on Monday. I'm Monday. getting back in the training. I'm getting back in the training. <laughs> you, you, Gene, you, you getting your Gene, you getting your cheeks together? Is that what you do? Hey, hey, I'm getting, getting everything get together. together now. Yeah, I'm getting everything together. Okay. He, he inspired me. That inspired me. Hit the okay. gym. I'm squat. <laughs> Rashid, I'm telling you, thank you. <laughs> Tap, y'all got me inspired. You know, I'm serious. That's my boy. He always do. He, he always finds a way of doing that. That's, damn. <laughs> I love you, Larry. I love you, Larry. He's God. trying to talk his way out of the scene. And then he came up. <laughs> All right. So, Gene, it's your turn now. Yeah, let's hear it. Idea of a romantic evening. Y'all ready? Yes, we're ready. Okay. Well, the first thing I would try to do is, you know, we definitely want to go out and have a nice bite to eat. We want to make sure she likes, know what she wants and likes. But you need to know that beforehand so you make the reservations. Okay, whether you, what would be good is that you have someone pick her up instead of you driving her. 
meet you at that restaurant and also have the things that you found out about her that she likes to have been ordered. So she sits down. You're not even there yet. You're there, but you're, you're lurking. You make sure that they sit her down properly. You know her favorite wine. You make sure they bring her a glass of wine. As she's sitting there, she's waiting for you. When you come in, you got to be clean. You got to smell good. You got to look good. You got to have a walk. And when you sit down, you got to smoothly sit back down and you got to look into her eyes. Eye contact is most important because she's already impressed. I hear she's Barry gonna, White in the background, brother. She, she, just, <laughs> she's already impressed. Okay, Rico that you, Suave. That, 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 you picked her, that you picked her up, that, that somebody picked her up, brought her there, they brought her wine. Okay, now you have the meal. The one thing that's really great that a woman enjoys is a stimulating conversation. Mm. Not foolishness, but a stimulating conversation. <laughs> You have that. Now you're leaving okay. together. You go back. Now, as soon as you go back, I'll make this quick. Okay. While she's sitting down, you know, she may, you may have another drink. You go in there and you make the bubble bath. Not so much a bubble bath, but the one with the petals oh, and the oh salts my. in there. You make sure wow. that the water's done. She doesn't know what's happening because she's downstairs or in the other room chilling. You went to the yeah. bathroom. She's giving you time. Mm -hmm. So now all of a sudden that, that, that bubble bath is up. And I know how to make the bubbles. You sweat your arms and make the bubbles build up. And as you still continue your, your conversation, she would say, oh, would you, my, my neck, my body feels a certain way. You grab her hand, you lead her to the bathroom and say, this is for you. Now, she may not want to basically just show herself to say that I don't want to be like I'm easy or anything, but who's going to turn down a bubble bath with the roses in it, the candles on, the lights is out, the towel is over there on the, on the thing, and it looks so scrumptious in there. She's going to take her clothes off and get into the tub. And what you do while she sits in the tub, you sit on the floor. You sit back, you have a glass of wine with her while she lays back, close her eyes, and enjoy the bubble bath. Bubble bath trap. Gene, it sounds like you've done this before. I have. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. But you, know, but you know the thing about it is? It's a little I'm, steamy I'm, here in the studio. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> But I'm gonna I'm I'm tell you the thing that, that, that I love the most, the thing that makes it so beautiful is that the person that does it enjoys to do it to see that person happy, not to do it to gain something, but to see them happy. That's why I like enjoy doing that, to see them happy and pleased. And I'm, and I'm good. Right. Hey, Jackie. That's amazing. Yes, Jackie. How, how do you get those blow up, the people that's asking you questions, how do you get, how do I see those? You mean on Facebook or yeah, like, what Facebook, do you mean? Facebook. Well, we, we, we would have to like kind of go back to those, you know what I'm saying? Once oh. I like release them, once it's recorded, what you, what you thinking? No, no, no. People are hitting me. Everybody's hitting me up asking me. I want to hear, I want to see those blow ups, what they saying about that. <laughs> <laughs> the tap, I think it's your turn to tell about your romantic evening, brother. Yeah. Oh, yes. Hello. Hello. Tap. Yes, Tapper. Let's go, Tap. You know what? Mm -hmm. they, I got a new nickname that my friends, uh, uh, Larry, and I gave to Larry, but now <laughs> I have the new crown. To tell you the truth, guys, I'm going to pass on because you know what? They call me Big Dusty. <laughs> <laughs> I got the Dusty. I got the dustiest <laughs> penis in New York. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I am big dust. So I don't know. Bro, man, Is powder coming out? I'm a, I'm a prime, hey, Gene, I'm a prime. I'm a COVID quarantine dusty big tap. But you know what? Sooner or later, I'm gonna come out of this shell. But right the now, the vaccine will. is coming, brother. The vaccine. Hello. Is coming. <laughs> the vaccine is coming. Go get I'm you a manny and petty. Is that <laughs> <laughs> wow, guys. You know what? Wild. I have had such a wonderful time with you, gentlemen. Time just flew by. We have two yes, minutes has. left. Oh my god! Two oh, minutes god. left. Well, like uh, it was great. Guys, I appreciate it. It was fun and um, it was nice talking to you and I'm glad we got to do this. Thank oh, you. It was, this, was, this was a great one. Dean, man, it was a pleasure, man. Thanks again. And Larry, look, I can never stop thinking, Larry, hey guys, listen, every concert I ever went to in Madison Square Garden, I owe everything to Larry Jones. <laughs> you know, I no mean, doubt. I can never stand. It's like, I swear to God, I'll be at work right where I am right now. 
I'll get a phone call and it's Larry, I'm at the door, come to the door. So I'll come <laughs> to the door, I'll come to the door, it'll be him and his, and his and Ruthie, his girlfriend, and they'll have a gift for me all the time. That's you know? awesome. And guess what, guys? You know what? I would never, I don't know why it's just me. I don't know if it's me. I don't know if I'm just an imbecile, but I would never think about getting Larry a gift. He always gets me a gift and I feel like an idiot. Don't feel like an yes, idiot, sir. brother. Don't, don't, don't go there, Tap. You're my boy, man. No, it's just all love. It's all That's right, love. exactly, exactly, Gino. It's all love, it, it always, it, it's just Larry, man. I, I, you know what, man? I appreciate everything you do, man. I appreciate you I too, bro. That. That's my big brother, man, you know? And no. I love you too. <laughs> Gene, I love you too, Thank brother. You so much. I love you too, Tap, no doubt. No, West Philly Speed Boys forever. <laughs> you Thank know you. it. We'd like to invite you, gentlemen. Rashid, Lori, this was, this was definitely a loving podcast tonight, man. I love all you guys. I love all you guys. And Jackie and Lori, I'll tell you part two of that rest of that that woman's <laughs> evening <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely yes yeah. <laughs> inquiring minds want, want to know. know yes they do with the yeah. chat exactly. listen you two sisters thank you very much for all your help and thank you, Larry. continued success keep doing what you guys are doing okay, yes thank yes. you we'd love to have you gentlemen back in the new year we're putting together some uh interesting panels and i think both of you would be a welcomed addition well thank you okay. for having me rashid good job man <laughs> yeah. Thanks, you props, Thanks, a lot, you props. Thanks a lot, Rasheed. Thanks a lot. Love you guys, man. All right. All right. All right. Be well. Take care. Take care. Bye -bye. Have a good right. night. Bye bye. bye. See, you. See, you. See, you. See, you. See you tap. All right, babe. <laughs> no okay. doubt.